Well, good afternoon. Thank you all very much for having me. Really appreciate it. And this, this uh, lecture is more about communication than it is about the uh, Ku Klux Klan and neo-Nazis. But what I do is I use those groups as extremes compared to a black person. And so you take a look at some of the things that I've done, it should make it a little easier for you to go home for Thanksgiving dinner and talk about anything over the table. Because <laughs> we know the past couple of years have been difficult for many of us, talking to our friends and our families and about different things, and not just about race. You know, it could be about abortion, could be about global warming, nuclear weapons, the current presidency, the war in the Middle East. You know, you have one opinion, they have another opinion, and rather uh, than pursue combat or a fight, you avoid talking about it and nothing gets done. Okay, well, I grew up as a child of parents in the U.S. Foreign Service, so I lived a lot overseas as a kid and come back home every two years back here, then go back overseas again. Today, as a professional musician, I travel all over the world performing. When you combine my travels with my folks, uh, to com combined with my travels now as an adult, I've been in a total of 57 different countries on six continents. So I've experienced a multitude of ethnicities, cultures, religions, practices, and all of that has helped shape who I've become and my perspective. This right here is about 27 years ago at a KKK rally. I was curious as to how someone can hate me when they didn't even know me. This was the result of me marching in a Cub Scout parade in Belmont, Massachusetts as the only black scout. While most of the people cheered, cheered us, we were marching from Lexington to Concord to commemorate the ride of Paul Revere. People are yelling, the British are coming and smiling and cheering us. But there was a small group of people on the sidewalk who began throwing rocks and bottles and soda pop cans at me, and I was getting hit. And I did not understand it. I thought I, I had done something wrong. And my cub master, my troop leader, my den mother all came rushing over and escorted me out of the danger, protecting me with their bodies. These were all white people protecting me and the ones uh, assaulting me. When I got home, my mom and dad asked me, how did you fall down and get all scraped up as they're putting band-aids on me? I said, I didn't fall down. I told them exactly what had happened. For the first time in my life, my mom and dad sat me down and explained what racism was to me. Believe it or not, at the age of 10, I had never heard the word racism. I'd been around people from all over the world at that age, and I'd, I got along with each and every one of them, regardless of their color. This thing, racism, was totally foreign to me. And I didn't have big brothers and sisters to learn things from, you know, from their experiences. All I had were my mom and dad. I'm an only child. My folks got it right the first time. And uh, <laughs> my mom and dad never lied to me. They always told me the truth. If I had a question or a problem, they solved it for me, gave me the answer, or gave me the tools by which I could do it myself. So when they told me why I was being hit, I did not believe them. I literally thought they were lying to me. I could, my 10-year-old brain could not wrap itself around the idea that someone who had never spoken to me, someone who knew absolutely nothing about me, would want to inflict pain upon me for no other reason than this, the color of my skin. It made no sense. So I didn't believe them. A month and a half later, that same year, 1968, on April the 4th, Martin Luther King was assassinated. And every major city in this country, including right here where you all are, New York City, Washington, D.C., my hometown, Chicago, Nashville, Detroit, Baltimore, Philadelphia, all burned to the ground with destruction and violence, all in the name of that new word I had learned, racism. So now I knew that this thing, racism, does exist, but I did not know why. And I formed a question in my mind at that age, which was, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? And now for almost the next 52 years, I've been looking for the answer to that question. So who better to ask than someone who would go so far as to join an organization that has over a hundred year history of practicing hating people who do not look like them and who do not believe as they believe. So I began seeking out KKK members and supremacists to find out, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? I never set out to convert anybody. 
I just want the answer to my question so I can, you know, process it and try to understand. So I would attend Klan rallies and different things. Like I said, this is about 27 years ago, about 100 pounds ago. Uh, <clears throat> towards the end of the rally, you can see the burning cross in the background. Uh, this one was about uh, almost four years ago. The first one was in Maryland, that one is in Missouri, towards the end of a rally. Now, what do I do with these things? I talk to people. I try to learn and understand, okay? When I, when I ask people this, how can you hate me when you don't even know me? This guy right here with the green cross on his face, he threatened me when I came on the rally ground. This other guy here, you can barely see his face, he was the leader. He was murdered a couple years ago. I'm told things like, we hate you because you're a criminal. Black people are prone to crime. That is why there are more blacks in prison than there are whites. Well, that's a half-truth. Yes, there are more blacks in prison than there are whites, but not because we're prone to crime, because of an, an equitable judicial system. I'm told that blacks are lazy. We don't want to work. We prefer to scam the government welfare system. And I'm also told that black people have smaller brains than white people. Therefore, we don't have the brain capacity to have a, as high an IQ as white people. Now, when you hear these things, and you're standing as close as I am to somebody like that, <clears throat> are those words offensive? Yes, they are very offensive. Am I offended? Absolutely not. Now, that's the difference. Most people would take offense at hearing that, and combat would be on, and nothing would be accomplished. And if you react to that kind of uh, provoking or, or provocative statements, all you're doing is lending credibility to what they're saying and empowering them, all right? Why should I be offended by somebody telling a lie? That person doesn't know me. I just met him five minutes ago. And all he sees is this, and has determined that I'm a criminal and that I'm lazy, you know, and I'm on, I'm on welfare, and my brain is small, I have a low IQ. So I let them get it all out. And then once they get it out, I listen, and I don't push back and attack, they're thrown off their game. And then I let them know, hey, you know what? I don't have a criminal record. I have never been on welfare. I've never measured my brain, but I'm sure it's the same size as anybody else's, all right? And then we go on from there. This, you know, you're planting a seed, but naturally you need to, to nourish that seed. You start here, and as you nourish that seed, you get here. You find more commonalities. And then by the time you get here, you have forged a relationship. You nourish the relationship, you get closer, find more commonalities. By the time you get here, you have developed somewhat of a friendship. And the trivial things that you have in contrast, such as skin color, or whether you go to a temple, a mosque, a synagogue, or a church, begin to matter less and less. Now, let's take a look at a few more recent things here. This is one of the many incidents that happened in Charlottesville uh, at the Unite the Right rally. <clears throat> These guys coming down the steps are Ku Klux Klan members. You don't know that because you don't see them in their robes and hoods. I know that because I know each and every one of those guys. Um, the guy in the white shirt is, well, is, was the Grand Dragon of Virginia, I mean, a state leader. He's trying to hit the black guy with, with his Confederate flagpole, and the black guy is trying to set them on fire with an improvised uh, flamethrower, aerosol can and a match. The Imperial Wizard, which means national leader, you don't see him, he's about right here. Uh, he had already come down the steps before the guy lit the, lit the uh, flamethrower. He's wearing a black bandana, a blue jean vest, and a black jeans. He comes around, walks this way, turns around, and now the guy has lit the fire. He sees him trying to set his members on fire. The leader, the Imperial Wizard, pulls out a gun, points it at the black guy's head, and shouts, hey, nigger, and then lowers the gun and fires it. And the bullet goes into the ground Right there, we see the gravel just opposite the uh, black gentleman's foot. And then he turns and he walks away right past the Charlottesville police, who are standing there in green neon vests, watching the whole thing go down and doing absolutely 
nothing. I'm going to show you the video of this. I'm just setting it up for you so you'll understand what happens here. And then I want to walk you through it. in the background the green was a gunshot. Okay. That's Charlottesville, Virginia. That's not New York City. But you know what? It could be. Don't think for one second, folks, that can't happen right here. It can happen right here. Anywhere hate happens, that can happen. And Charlottesville is as much a part of your city as New York City is. Any city in this country is your city as an American. All American cities are your city. You can only live in one at a time, but they all belong to you. So the problems that Charlottesville has are your problems. <clears throat> Just like when the Trade Center got hit, here in New York City. That's the problem of people living in Chicago and Los Angeles, because it's one of our cities, all right? What do you do when you see something like that happen in your society? Well, should we blame people? Let's blame the black guy. He's setting people on fire, trying to set them on fire with a flamethrower. Yeah, he should be blamed. He shouldn't be going around trying try to set somebody on fire. Let's blame the Klansmen for trying to hit somebody with their Confederate flagpoles. That's wrong, too. Let's blame the uh, Klan leader for pulling out a gun and firing it. That should not have happened. Let's blame the police, who we pay to what? Serve and protect. And they did absolutely nothing. Well, we can blame them. They didn't do their job. Or maybe we should blame ourselves for allowing our society to come to that point in the 21st century. But you know what? For everybody you blame, they're going to blame you back or blame somebody else. So all you're going to be doing is spending all day blaming. And nothing gets accomplished. I'm going to tell you something. Our society can only become one of two things. It can become one, <clears throat> that which we sit back and let it become. Or it can become two, that which we stand up and make it become. So I have a question for you all. Don't answer the question right now. But before you go to bed tonight, when you go home at the end of your day or evening, whatever, before you go to bed, I want you to think about my question and answer it to yourself. The question is this. Do I sit back and let my society see what my society becomes? Or do I stand up and make my society become what I want to see? That's the question. And only you can answer that question for yourself. Now, I'll tell you how I answered it. I chose the second option. I chose to stand up. Now, you saw the imperial wizard in his street clothes. Here he is in his uh, traditional clan uniform. All right? What did I do? I called that guy up on the phone. I said, hey, man, you and I need to talk. Not Klansman to black man, but man to man. American to American. Your Confederate history is as much a part of my history as my black history is a part of yours. It's all American history intertwined. Let's get together and let's explore American history together. I talked to him for about half an hour. He agreed. We set a date. I drove to his house an hour and a half from mine by myself, unarmed. I sat in his living room on his Confederate blanket on his couch. His whole house is full of KKK stuff, noose hanging on the wall, uh, pictures of Nathan Bedford Forrest, the first um, Klan leader, and all kinds of stuff. And along with his uh, fiance, who's a Klanswoman, I sat there and I listened to him give me a lesson in American history from a Confederate perspective, of course, for two hours. <clears throat> some things he got right, some things he got wrong. But I listened, and when he finished, I corrected him on the things he got wrong. When it was my turn, I said, here's what I want to do. Let's set a date. 
You come down to my house. I live right outside of D.C. in Maryland. Come down to my house. I will arrange tickets for us to go to the new Smithsonian National Museum of African American History and Culture. Let's explore that museum together. They said, okay. We set a date. I have a contact down there. I got some tickets. They came down to my house. I put them in my car. We drove downtown to the museum. This is us entering the museum. Notice the uh, head attire. Okay, and that's the uh, imperial wizard who fired the gun and, and his clan's lady fiance. What do we do while we're in there? We checked out displays on uh, slavery, on integration, segregation. We watched little video clips on blacks in the arts, blacks in medicine, in music, in education, in sports, uh, et cetera. And you know, his, um, his biggest uh, music idol is Elvis Presley. I love Elvis Presley. I, I saw Elvis 14 times. I met Elvis, and I went to Elvis's funeral. I love Elvis. But Elvis did not invent rock and roll. My boss invented rock and roll. My boss was Charles Edward Anderson Berry, better known to most of you as Chuck Berry. And I played piano for Chuck Berry on and off for 32 years. And one of his uh, Cadillacs, his cherry red Cadillac, which I saw at his house, is now in the museum. So anybody who likes rock music, I don't care if it's Led Zeppelin, The Beatles, The Rolling Stones, Elton John, Metallica, Twisted Sister, Ozzy Osbourne, anybody who plays rock, all of their DNA goes back to Chuck Berry. So I took him to see Chuck Berry's car you know, on another floor in the museum. Now, you notice, you notice he's holding his fiance, right? He's holding the clans lady. So here we go to see the car. Now who's holding his fiance? <laughs> I work fast. OK. So that's Chuck Berry's car. Now, we toured the museum for about two and a half hours. There's no way you can take in everything in two and a half hours. You can't even do it in two and a half weeks. You got to go back and go back and go back to saturate yourself with so much vast history that we don't learn in one month. OK. <clears throat> we left the museum. I gave her my cell phone, said, here, take a picture of the Imperial Wizard and myself. And I went and stood by the, by the uh, marquee for the museum. This is what he did, totally unplanned. Well, there's myself and Chuck Berry, OK? <laughs> Playing Johnny Be Good. You're going into his duck walk. There. Now, that does not happen overnight. That's a long ways from, hey, nigger, boom. A little bit less than a year. August 12th, 2017 was that, was that rally in Charlottesville. That was the end of June 2018. It's a little bit less than a year. The story does not end there. It goes much deeper. He's going to marry that clan's lady in a couple weeks from that picture. I've been working with him for a year. We've developed a friendship. Now, he still has a little ways to go, but at least he's going in the right direction. He invites me to the wedding. All right? It goes even deeper than that. I'm the only black guy at a Klan wedding, right? But it goes deeper than that. Her fa she's from Tennessee, the Klan's lady. Her father is too ill to come all the way up to Maryland to escort his daughter down the aisle to give her away. She asked me if I would walk her down the aisle rather than ask one of their trusted Klan members, one of the guys coming down the stairs with the Confederate flagpoles. I said, yeah, I'll walk you down the aisle, sure. So there we are. You look up in his bedroom window, you see the Confederate flag. Like I said, he still has a little ways to go. But at least he's going in the right direction. Now, CNN had, um, had interviewed him a while back. And he said he was going to be buried in his Klan robe. So I asked him if CNN could come to the wedding. And he trusted me. He said, yeah, he, goes, he said, just ask him not to film any faces of, of my members. You know, you, you, they don't want the publicity, but you can film myself and the Klan's lady and the, and the preacher. I said, okay. So here we are. As you stand in the presence of God. This time, it was Davis giving something away. The broad. Me and his friendship has been something really special. She wanted me to be a part of this wedding. That's beautiful. That's a seed planted. 
There you have the imperial wizard, the clansman, the bride, the clans lady, and the surrogate father. Again, this does not happen overnight, but it happens with communication. In this country, we spend way too much time talking about the other person, or talking at the other person, or talking past the other person. Why don't we spend some time talking with the other person? And things like that can be achieved. I'm going to tell you what. What did I say I majored in? Jazz, music, OK? My degree is in music. I'm just a rock and roll piano player, all right? I'm not a sociologist or a psychologist. If I can do that as a rock and roll piano player, certainly you all can sit at your dinner table and have, and have conversations with your family about anything. Okay? Civil discourse is the key. Listening is the key. Knowing who you are, don't take offense when somebody says something to you and you know they don't know that about you. Because all you're doing is empowering them to, believe, to continue believing it. Listen to them. When they get done insulting or whatever it is they're presenting, you know, then you can respond and they will listen back because they've been heard. Everybody wants to be heard. Everybody wants to be respected. I do not respect what he stands for or many of the things that he says, but I respected his right to say them. It bothers me a great deal as an American. We call ourselves the greatest nation on the face of this earth. Don't get me wrong, I love my country. I'm patriotic, but that bothers me. Perhaps technologically, and you all know about technology here at Google, perhaps technologically, we are indeed the greatest. We, Americans, put a man on the moon. We invented that technology. And while Neil Armstrong was up there walking around talking about one small step for a man and one giant leap for mankind, we were able to talk with them all the way from Earth to the moon via satellite radio phone. We invented that technology. Everybody in here has email. Everybody, oh, Gmail, I should say, right? <laughs> Everybody in here has a cell phone. Hit a few numbers, hit a few words, hit send. You're talking to people right next door in Jersey or California, Australia, Africa, China, you know, any, any, anywhere you want to talk. We invented that technology. How is it that we as Americans can talk to people all over the world and as far away as the moon, but so many of us have difficulty talking to the person who lives right next door because they are a different color, a different religion, a different persuasion, a different whatever. It seems to me that before we can call ourselves the greatest, our ideology needs to catch up to our technology. And when we get them both up there, then we can truly brag. Folks, we are living in the 21st century, in case anybody's forgotten. We are living in space age times. So why are there so many of us still thinking with Stone Age minds? Thank you very much, appreciate it. Wow. Thank you, Daryl. Thank you, Chris. Um, so many ways that we can go with this conversation. Before we jump in here, uh, we're going to do about 15 minutes or so on the stage, just Daryl and myself, and then we're going to have Q&A. So start thinking about your questions. I know that I, I have so many. So I'll start, with, I'll start with this. You spoke a lot about, uh, well, subtly talked about education, how you educated yourself uh, not only about this country and history on both sides, but also about the Klan. Right? You're very knowledgeable about the ranks, about who holds what position, what have you. Can you speak a bit about the role education plays in connecting with somebody and what you've done to prepare yourself for these types of conversations? Absolutely. You know, no matter what kind of conversation you want to get into, and like I said, you can take race off the table. You know, you're into a conversation about abortion or about uh, climate change or whatever. Learn as much as you can about the other person's perspective. Put yourself in their shoes. You know, how would they think based upon what you know about them or about this ideology? Okay? And then formulate your, your, uh, your uh, defense about that. Mm -hmm. okay? Learn as much as you can. And, you know, I'll, like I said, I'll be 62 next month. So when I was a kid, if I wanted to learn something, fortunately, my parents, we, you know, we had encyclopedias in the house. I used to go down to the basement, pull one off the shelf and look up whatever I wanted to. 
But if you didn't have a set of encyclopedias, you had to get up, get dressed, go to the library, either at your school or the, or the, or the neighborhood library, and read up on whatever it is you want to learn. Mm -hmm. Today, what do you do? You Google it, <laughs> right? You, ha you have these resources at your fingertips. There is no excuse whatsoever for you to go into any situation, go to a foreign country, and not know the do's and don'ts of how to behave or how to communicate with somebody. For, you know, for, for example, um, we as Americans oftentimes think that people in foreign countries do the same thing we do. Not always the case. Not always the case. Uh, for example, you know, if, if Chris here were to, let's say I'm a businessman, he's a businessman. I want to conduct business with him. So I get together with him. He invites me over to his home. His wife prepare, prepares a nice dinner. And I sit there, I eat dinner, wipe my mouth, fold my napkin up, sit it by the table. And we retire to the living room for a cup of coffee and talk some more business. That's normal. But if I were to go to Norway, Chris is Norwegian, and I want to do some import-export business with, with this guy in Norway. So we communicate over the Internet. I fly over there to make a deal with him. And um, he invites me to his home, and his wife prepares dinner. I sit there, finish the dinner, delicious meal, wipe my mouth, fold my napkin, put it at the table, go to the living room. I just told his wife that I did not like the meal, and I'm never coming back. How did I tell her that? By folding the napkin. That's an insult. You want to ball the napkin up and put it on the table. So if you don't know that, you might go somewhere and out of your ignorance, because you didn't study up on it, you're going to blow your deal because you have suddenly or, or, or rather overtly insulted somebody. And these are things where we have no excuse to, especially with technology like Google, that we can prepare ourselves, look up, you know, how do we greet somebody in this country that I'm going to? What should, I, what should I do? What should I not do? The do's and don'ts. Educate yourself. Education is the key to, 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 to a curing ignorance. Mm -hmm. And I can tell you something. The, a lot of the problem with racism in, in this country is this. It's, it's a chain. It starts with ignorance. Ignorance leads to fear. If you don't keep that ignorance in check and cure it, all right? We fear what we don't understand, the things that we don't know, that we, of which we're ignorant. If you don't keep that fear in check, mm -hmm. that fear in turn will escalate and lead to hatred because we hate the things that frighten us. If you don't keep that hatred in check, that will escalate and lead to destruction. Um, we want to destroy the things that, that we hate. Why? Because they frighten us. Mm -hmm. But guess what? They could have been harmless, and we were just ignorant. We saw that whole chain unfold in Charlottesville that same day, when on August 12th, there was a lot of ignorance in Charlottesville. There was a lot of fear. There was a lot of hatred. And it culminated in destruction. When a white supremacist got inside his vehicle and tried to murder as many counter-protesters as he could by driving full speed into the crowd. He succeeded in injuring 20 people and murdering one young lady named Heather Heyer. Ignorance breeds fear. Fear breeds hatred. Hatred breeds destruction. Sometimes I talk to elementary schools, for example, uh, and middle schools, and I'll just be talking casually, you know, to these kids, and then all of a sudden, out of the blue, I'll say, hey, there's a snake under your chair. Mm -hmm. And they'll all jump and scream and throw their legs up in the air. And then they realize there's no snake there. <laughs> and, and they start laughing. And I say, well, why did you scream? Oh, well, you know, uh, I'm, I'm afraid of snakes. I, I, I hate snakes. Well, why do you hate them? Oh, well, they're, they're slimy. You know, they're, they're bad. They'll bite and da-da-da. Well, there's your ignorance. Snakes are not slimy. Snakes are dry. <laughs> OK? Uh, and not all snakes are bad. So there's your ignorance. And you say, I'm afraid of snakes. I hate snakes. So then I ask, OK, well, there is no snake under your chair. But let's just say there was a snake under your chair. What do you want me to do about it? You know what they all say? Kill it. There's a destruction. Mm -hmm. All right. We need to stop worrying about the hate. Let's stop worrying about the hate. Let's stop worrying about the fear. Let's go to the source. 
The source is ignorance. And there is a cure for ignorance. And that cure is called education. If you cure the ignorance, there's nothing to fear. If there's nothing to fear, there's nothing to hate. Mm -hmm. If there's something to hate, there's nothing to destroy. You know, you have two kinds of people. You have people who are ignorant. You have people who are, who are stupid. And some people define ignorance and stupidity as being synonymous. Mm -hmm. Me, I don't. For me, personally, an ignorant person is someone who makes the wrong decision or a bad choice because he or she does not have the facts, mm -hmm. does not have the proper information to make a good choice or the correct decision. You give that person the facts, you have alleviated their ignorance. A stupid person is someone who has the facts, who has the right information, and they still make the wrong choice. For example, if I were to paint the walls in a room and I don't post any signs that say wet paint, stay off the walls, anybody walking into that room is ignorant to the fact that the walls are wet. And they might go and lean up against the wall and now they got paint on their clothes because they didn't know. I can fix that. I can post signs that say wet paint, stay off the walls. I can stand in the doorway, tell each person coming in, hey folks, gather around the center. I just painted these walls five minutes ago. All right, they're still wet. So now everybody has the facts. Everybody has the education. Everybody has the proper information. But still, one person goes and leans against the wall, and now he wants to know why is there paint on his clothes? It's because he's stupid. <laughs> okay? So fortunately, there is a, a cure for ignorance. It's education. Unfortunately, there's no cure for stupidity. If you give somebody the education, they choose not to use it. There's nothing you can do until they employ it. Mm -hmm. uh, remind me not to invite you to my future second grade classroom. <laughs> uh, <laughs> when any parents call me up. Um, <laughs> so you, you said something really key there in terms of, um, you know, provide the information, you can cure the ignorance. You know, we think here at Google that we're providing a lot of information. We're and providing you access to the world's information that's part of our mission. Um, but there are stupid people out here. So bringing those people to the table has been a hallmark of the last 35 years of your life. So can you talk a little bit more about how you bring people who otherwise would have access to information, who maybe not choose to look into it, right. they have access to it. How do you bring them to a point where they want to even listen to the information and then from there to ingest it and possibly change the ideology? Right. Okay, I, I just want to point out one thing, though. Mm -hmm. um, not, not everybody, I, I'm not considering everybody who, who's a white supremacist or whatever uh, to be stupid. Okay. Many of them are not stupid by any means. Um, they go from third grade dropout all the way to president of the United States. President Warren G. Harding was sworn into the Ku Klux Klan in the green room of the White House. President Harry Truman had joined the Klan for a very short time before he became president. And he didn't like it, he got out and became president. Supreme Court Justice Hugo Black was in the Ku Klux Klan when he got the appointment to the Supreme Court. He had to leave the Klan to sit on the Supreme Court. Senator Robert Byrd, who just passed away a few years ago, oldest living senator uh, from West Virginia, he was a Klansman back in the 1940s. So, it, you know, it ranges from, from the guys who throw chairs on Geraldo and Jerry Springer all the way to, you know, college graduates with advanced degrees. Um, the stupid part is, you know, thinking that the color of your skin gives them superiority. But uh, academic, academically, they're all across the board. Uh, you bring them to the table by, by inviting them to a conversation. Don't frame it as a debate. Yes, you are going to debate something, for sure, but frame it as a conversation. Because when you say a debate, people's walls go up and they're ready to defend something and engage in some kind of, you know, uh, verbal combat. Uh, but say, look, you know, I want to understand why you feel the way you do. Mm -hmm. I want you to convince me that I should think about things from another point of view. I want to try to see things from your point of view. I'm here to listen. That's one thing they don't get. Because usually it's always some, oh, somebody pushing back, yeah. pushing back. So they're happy. You know, now they have a platform. And the more they talk, the more flaws you're going to find, mm -hmm. especially if you're right. Mm -hmm. And you just, you just, you know, just let them come out, yeah. and then you just make a mental note, and then you address each one of them. Because at the end of the day, I've seen this happen many, many times. At the end of the day, we each have to go home and think about the interaction that we have with one another. And then what happens with them is, they think, you know, what Daryl said 
is, I think is right, but he's black. But, but it's right, but he's black. Mm-hmm. So it's a cognitive dissonance kind of thing. And then they struggle because how can a black person be right? You know, you know we're criminals, we're on welfare, we have small brains. Um, and then they have to decide themselves, do I continue living my life as a lie or do I turn around and live the truth? That's their struggle. And they convert themselves. That's why I say, I don't convert them. I'm just the impetus to give them food for thought and allow them to process it. That's powerful. I think you you brought up a point about your education background and how you're not a sociologist or a psychologist. The, The experts we typically turn to to change ideology. But instead, you got to people through music. Mm-hmm. So can you talk, talk a little bit more about how music and other mediums like sports and um, technology can actually bring people into the conversation um, and how you've utilized not just your music, but also your love of this country to bring folks into rooms? Sure. I mean, music is a common denominator for everybody. You know, and there's that, that old uh, adage, what, music sues the savage beast, mm-hmm. something like that. We all like music. Even neo-Nazis like music. Uh, Klansmen like music. You know, black supremacists like music. Everybody likes music. So, for example, if, um, let's say I want to go out dancing. To, yep. What's today? Today's Friday, right? Mm-hmm. So, uh, you know, Friday night, I want to go out and do some dancing. So I go to some club. It might be, have a live band. It might have um, a DJ, whatever. So I'm there, and a good song is playing, and the dance floor is full, and I want to dance. First thing I'm going to do is I'm going to look around and see if I see a, you know, a single, single lady there you know, who's not attached to anybody. And um, I see her right there. What's your name? Renna. Renna. I see Renna, and um, she's sitting at the bar, and she's doing like this on the bar. So obviously, you're know, beating to the beat of the music. Obviously, she enjoys that song, too. Now, I don't know Renna, but I'm going to walk over and say, hey, you know, would you like to dance? She'll say, yeah. She pops off her bar stool, and we're out on the dance floor. If it's a slow song, Renna and I are like this, mm-hmm. dancing around in a circle, right? I don't even know her, but I got my arms around her. If it's a fast song, you know, we're apart, shaking or whatever we're doing, right? At the end of the song, um, being the gentleman that I'm supposed to be, I escort her back to her seat. By the way, my name's Daryl. You know, what's your name? Renna. And so, uh, you know, so Daryl, what do you do? I say, well, um, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a, I'm a busboy at the local restaurant down the street. You know, what do you do, Renna? And she says, well, I'm, I'm president of Google. <laughs> 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 you know, where would two people that far at opposite ends of the spectrum, not just job-wise, but financial-wise, everything-wise, come that close without even knowing each other? Music brought us together, mm-hmm. all right? Here, here at Google, uh, you know, if you have a Google party, chances are most people are going to be in, in technology, development, IT, all this other kind of stuff. You know, a lot of computer, a lot of technolo- technological things. But if you go to a nightclub or, or a music festival, people are going to be there from all walks of life. There'll be the Google workers, the restauranters, you know, the person who paints the W O line down the street, mm-hmm. the person who picks up your trash on Saturday mornings. Everybody is there. Yep. Music, music is a great thing to bring people together. Absolutely. All right, so uh, one more question from me, and then we'll do Q&A, so you can start uh, lining up at the microphones if you have any questions. Um, so one thing that we spoke about before this conversation, and I would love the, the room to, to hear this piece, is around uh, how we apply this in our lives um, in 2020. And so, of course, um, you know, there, ra- there's racism and destruction uh, pervading our city here in New York, our country, and our broader world. Um, but you mentioned how you've been to 57 countries on six continents. And I know you're a true believer in, in travel being one of the ways that we remove ourselves from ignorance and, and gain an understanding of culture and, and life. So can you just give us some advice, one, about the role of travel in bringing us closer to other people, but also how we can apply what you have learned through your journey to our day-to-day lives as we engage with this multi-ethnic, multi-diverse company and also city that we live in? Well, you know, yes, exposure is a, is a big key. And he, here at Google, you know, you have a very diverse company, people from all walks of life, 
all persuasions, all colors, you know, coming together on a daily basis. Mm -hmm. A lot of places don't have that, folks. You know, I, I, I have performed in uh, 49 of our 50 states, and I don't see a whole lot of that. I see it right here. I've seen it in some other places, but it's rare. And you, you are at an advantage here. Um, and Google putting on this kind of a talk. You know, a few years back, having this kind of conversation was taboo. People did not want to discuss race. No, 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 can't talk about that. You know, keep that under the carpet, lock it in the closet, you know, to turn a blind eye, to, you, know, do, you know, if you don't see it, it doesn't exist. You know? So you all are benefiting from these kinds of things. Don't take it for granted. You know, share it with other people. I call it walking across the cafeteria. Oftentimes, in, uh, in metropolitan cities like New York or near where I live, Washington, D.C., people from different backgrounds will work on the same project in the same cubicle even together. But what happens at um, 12 noon? They go downstairs to the cafeteria and blacks sit with blacks, Hispanics sit with Hispanics, and so forth. They tend to what we call self-segregate. Now, does that mean that they're racist? No, it does not mean that they're racist. People tend to feel more comfortable around somebody who shares, you know, their language or their culture or their color or, or whatever it is they believe, all right? And there's nothing wrong with that. If it gets too extreme, then yes, you cross that line into supremacy or separatism. But every so often, take a walk across the cafeteria and sit with someone else that you don't normally sit with every time you go downstairs for lunch or dinner. Because we all have something to teach and we all have something to learn. And the more we talk to one another, the more we find out how much more we actually have in common. And somebody has the answer to a question we've had and we have the answer to a question that they may have had. But those questions will never be answered if you don't come in contact with one another. I was telling Chris earlier about one of my favorite quotes of all time. It's by Mark Twain. It's called the travel quote. And Mark Twain said, travel is fatal to prejudice, bigotry, and narrow-mindedness. And many of our people need it sorely upon these accounts. Broad, wholesome, charitable views of men and things cannot be acquired by vegetating in one little corner of the earth all one's lifetime. And that is so true. And as our country becomes more and more diverse, you know, we need to catch up and, and get to know one another. It, 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 you know, I can't tell you how much it pained me back in, uh, in 2008. Um, every time you turn on the news, I don't care if it was CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, um, you know, during the presidential campaigns and stuff, you know, all they talked about was, could a black man be president? Could a woman be president? Could a Mormon be president? We're talking about Mitt Romney and Hillary and Obama. Uh, who cares? Who cares whether it's a woman, a black, or, or a Mormon? I want somebody that can run this country, regardless of what they are, all right? We call ourselves a first world country. Yet, there are third world countries out here that have female presidents female prime ministers, the idea, their ideology far supersedes ours. They may be nowhere near where we are in technology, but their ideology far supersedes ours. Why are we so worried about what somebody, wh where they worship or, or what, what color they are? We want somebody that can lead the country. We had the same thing happen in, in, in 1961 with uh, President Kennedy. The question was, could a Catholic be, a pre be, be a president of the United States? He was the first Catholic president. Who cares? When are we going to get over that? You would have thought we would have learned our lesson back then. So this is what's important, you know? We have enough information right here, right here at our fingertips to learn about people. Let's educate ourselves. Let's educate one another. That education and exposure are the key to, a lot, to solving a lot of our problems. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my question is along the lines of what you were talking about with educating and listening. Um, uh, in my experience, I've had 
uh, roommate, for example, who uh, was, was from Northern Virginia and asked me one time about, uh, do I believe in white privilege? And then that opened up a conversation uh, to, to kind of talk about some of these things. Um, but in that process, I found that um, as I listened to him and some of the sources that he was listening to or, or ingesting uh, and tried to share um, and just listen to his, uh, that we ran into or within our um, within this age, this technology age, we also run into the issue of uh, somewhat of an echo chamber. And so while uh, he said he wanted to listen and hear some of the things that I would share, to, um, he could also just be very uh, closed-minded in the sense of giving me more of, uh, of what he was listening to. So for example, like picking up a book, I would suggest reading 10 pages to coming back to, um, to his points. Uh, so how do you, so I guess the question is twofold. How do you really um, continue to educate and, and listen in those conversations where that's happening and also deal with the uh, technology, the, the echo chambers that technology creates that kind of prevent um, some of those walls from being broken down? Yeah, echo chambers are, are probably the, the biggest detriment because people surround themselves with people who believe as they believe. And so it just bounces back and forth, reinforcing each other. Right? But you, but you got to keep planting that seed and, and deal with these people one-on-one -on -one because, you know, they will. They, they may not break down in front of you and say, you know, you got a point there, whatever. Sometimes they will. But at home, they do that. Trust me, they do that because... When they change, I question them, you know, what was the change? And they tell me, well, you know, I got to thinking about it. In other words, I got to thinking about it. You know, so that way, you know, you're not present and they're on their own and they're weighing it. So, that, so when they're not around their little echo chamber, they're in their bedroom getting ready to go to sleep, it's rolling around their head and they're having that push-pull. You know, well, Caliph, you know, made a point, but, but, but he's, he's a Democrat or he's black or he's gay or he's whatever, whatever I'm not, you know, but he's right. So they struggle, but, but, but then they got, they, got, they got to figure out, was I ignorant or, or am I stupid? And nobody wants to be stupid. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thanks, Caleb. I think also the, uh, the listening piece, right? You talked a lot about how you have to uh, take in what that person uh, is saying, but also give, the, give an understanding to their context, right? And like where they come from. And then you're able to actually break down some of the right. walls. Right. Yeah, listening is very important, and, and it's important to do it respectfully. Mm -hmm. You know, even though you, you may not respect what there's, the content of what they're saying, give them the respect of allowing them to air their point of view. Absolutely. And chances are they will reciprocate. Thank you. I just want to say thank you for coming, Daryl. It's, it's really great to thank you. Thank you for having me. This is excellent talk. Um, so along those lines of technology, I, I wanted to hear your take on how to avoid your conversations getting spun and getting taken out of context and getting changed so they serve some other viewpoint. Because you know, there's a lot of people in this room, and one person could, could take this conversation and you know, write something mean on Twitter and blast it to a million people. So as you use technology more and you're showing up in the news and you're coming here, how do you make sure that your point is getting across and those conversations are happening? That's something you know that you can't avoid. And that has happened to me numerous times. Mm. You know, people have put out memes on me, and and uh, one person uh, printed in the newspaper the first black KKK member. Mm. You know, which is stupid because if the KKK had black members, it wouldn't be a KKK. <laughs> so, but you know, <laughs> um, you know, that's something you know you, you cannot avoid. Uh, people will, will always be trying to put a spin on you or or twist your narrative. I mean, and that's you know that's been the, that's been the case since the beginning of time. Um, because you take, you take religion, even Christianity or Judaism. Why are there so many different denominations of Christianity? Methodist, Presbyterian, Baptist, Lutheran, on and on and on. They all, we all read the same King James Bible, but each denomination takes those verses and interprets them a little differently or twists them to suit their own narrative. And the Klan does the same thing, and people will do that for whatever reason. So, you know, you, at the end of the day, the truth will always prevail, all right? So yeah, people will, will, will spin you around, et cetera. 
you know, but uh, I started out playing the blues. And um, there's, there's a blues song, uh, and, the, and the blues always tells the truth. That's why the blues is still around today. And the blues, there's a blues song that says, if the washing don't get you, the rinsing sure will. <laughs> All right, so you, <laughs> you, uh, you always tell the truth, and that will always come through. Eventually, those lies will fall by the wayside. And I, I can't quote the, the name of the person right offhand, but um, let me paraphrase uh, the, the quote. The, the mass promulgation of a lie does not make it the truth any more than the, ma- than the, than the mass disbelief of the truth makes it a lie. You follow that? Thank you all for joining. Thank you, Daryl, for coming into Google thank New you. York. And, and thank have you. a great weekend. Thank you all. Thanks, Daryl. Thank you. Yeah.